reach such capacity. As we mentioned last week, God willing, we will be not in the situation next year, which is sad in one sense, because it's always fun to have everybody squeezed in like sardines in the tunnel, whatever the modern equivalent would be. Uh, but uh, it's, all, it's good to be together on this very important day. And so, if you have a Bible, you can just, if you'd like to follow a few verses to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and if you haven't, you can just listen to what I'm going to be saying in the message this morning. But it is the time that we do think about the empty grave and the empty tomb, and the fact of the missing body of Jesus on earth. For us Christians, we know that it's not missing. Uh, it's just not on earth any longer. The one who died has been raised again from the dead and now is seated at the right hand of God the Father. And we who believe that are eight-day people, eight-day people. You might have heard of the Seventh-day Adventists. Christians are eight-day people. And the symbol eight is a symbol in the Bible for a new beginning and even a new start and a new creation. And this day is filled with hope. And I pray that whatever might be happening in your life, I don't know many of you, that you might leave here for reasons for hope in Jesus Christ and be an eight-day person, that there is a new start that has begun in the Lord Jesus Christ. But this new start of the eighth day, if you read the Gospel accounts, took the people by surprise, didn't it? It took the woman that went to the, to the tomb, and it took the other disciples by surprise. It's not something that they were piously expecting and waiting for. They had actually forgotten and didn't remember the scriptures. But then there was the big bang that took place. Actually before, of course, early in the morning. The big bang of the new creation. Of the resurrection of the body in Jesus Christ. And that took them totally by surprise and had some time to really sink home about the fact that that same body was raised. So this is what we are celebrating. A new start that God has made in this world. A new start that He has launched. A new creation that has come about. It's not, just, it's not a small thing that we remember. It's a cosmic change that has taken place. A dead man has returned in a new body that God had fashioned for him, and more than a man, the Son of God. And so this day is hugely significant. Nothing can change the facts of this day today. Jesus has put his foot in the door of history, and nobody can close it. He's made a decisive change that is irreversible, and that if we think about it, is life-changing. On this day, Jesus was raised and a great new creation, a new age has begun. It has erupted into history. <coughs> Although we don't see it, it has already happened. Eruption is something that happens from the outside and eruption with the eye is something that breaks in from the outside in. And a volcano erupts from the inside out. Something from the outside has erupted and changed the course of history. And changed things once and for all. Now we know, I'm sure, that not everybody believes that Jesus' dead body was supernaturally raised by the power of God and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. I said that it took the disciples quite a while to wake up to the fact, this unprecedented fact that had never happened in history before. That death was not the final say, but there was a bodily life after death. It took the disciples a while, and uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, we see that actually there were some people in the church at Corinth who have also become very skeptical. They might say, yes, it's wonderful 
sentiment that we express in this morning, but uh, <coughs> do we really all believe dead bodies return? And uh, they were very skeptical about the fact <coughs> of somebody coming back from the dead. And Paul writes 1 Corinthians 15, I'm going to pick out a few truths in 1 Corinthians 15, to, to present the case of the fact that Jesus has risen from the dead, as Louis read, based on the eyewitnesses' accounts, and how this could be so, how this could be so, that somebody could rise from the dead. But of course, even in what I'm going to be saying this morning, faith is necessary, isn't it? Faith. Faith is what we have to have on this day. And this is not something, well, that is unusual. Christians are people of faith. We weren't there at the beginning of creation. Anybody was there? <coughs> we weren't there at the beginning of creation. How can anybody understand what happened at the beginning of history? The Bible gives a witness. We weren't there to empirically test it, but that's what faith is. We believe that this world was created supernaturally by God, by invisible, the invisible power of God at the beginning. I wasn't there, I can't see it, but I do believe that it's, it's true. And likewise, when it comes to the fact of the resurrection of Jesus, isn't the same thing? I wasn't there, but, and I can't see Him right now with my physical eye, but as I believe in creation in the beginning, so I believe, and I trust you believe too, that Jesus was raised from the dead. There's good reasons for that and that He is now seated at the right hand of God, and that He will return in His human body. And this is what faith is about. And as somebody prayed, Jesus commends us if we believe that. Jesus said to Thomas, who had to only believe empirically and physically, only if I put my finger in His, in his side and in His hands will I believe. And Jesus said, blessed are people who, who believe, though they have not seen this. And so I trust that we will be counted amongst those who are the blessed, according to what Jesus says. So what I want to do in this chapter is go through this quite quickly. And uh, I pray that God's Spirit would just cause a, an amen to rise in your hearts, a, a yes of what I'm going to be saying today. But I want to harvest some of Paul's points here in this chapter as he presents the great facts of the, of the risen Christ and then as he gives us some great alterations in the mind in a response to some of these facts. So let me go through some facts of what Paul is speaking about here because Christian faith is not a philosophy it's not an ideal, it's not a temperament, it's not a feeling, it's not a tradition. Our faith is based on the facts of history. And this is the way it's presented here. The eyewitness account and for many other reasons, these great facts of the risen, the risen Christ. And as I said in the beginning, the empty tomb is the great fact of our faith. And Paul here gives some, some further great statements and a reason and some consequences of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the, from the dead. And they might be quite unusual, so I, 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 um, I, I trust that what, what is revealed here about the story of our bodies and the story based on the story of the body of Christ will be pertinent and that the Spirit of God will use it. Because Jesus' resurrection from the dead is a fact that has huge implications for the human body. And Paul brings out some of these facts in the, this, this uh, particular chapter. So let me go through some of them. Verse 43, Paul says here about the body that we have from the resurrection body verse 43 of chapter 15. It is sown in dishonor and it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness 
and it is raised in power. Now I want to say, the Apostle Paul, as he reflects about the body of Jesus, firstly makes this great fact that you and I, if we are believers in Christ, we only and will ever have one body. A body that God has given us, and that body we will have forever. There's one body that God has given the Lord Jesus Christ, and on this day, we acknowledge that the same body that he was born in, and the same body that he was crucified in, Paul's point in this chapter is that in that same body, Jesus was raised from the dead. Jesus is now today not a disembodied spirit. He's not some ethereal phantom or spirit that's floating around. Jesus is in the same body that he got from his mother, it transformed, but it's the same body. And so he's known by the scars and known by the wounds, even now in glory, because it's the body that he was crucified in. And this is a, this is a very important fact of belief in the resurrection, that it's the same body that Jesus had when he was crucified that he was raised in. Do you know if you're a Christian, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you will have the same body forever. There's no second body, or third body, or another body, but this same body, just as it was the same body of Jesus, is the body, the one body, that uh, will be transformed into a resurrection body. That might come as quite a surprise, and we will have a look at some implications of that. But this is very important for understanding the story of Christ's body and the story of our body. Maybe you were thinking this morning that you can't wait to have another body. And I'm here to say to you, that won't happen. There is no second body. Just as though there's a second body to Jesus. It's the same body that was raised. We'll have a look at some implications before we go about that. That's the first thing I want to say. The second thing that Paul reveals in these chapters is that there are there were two versions to Jesus' body, weren't there? There were two versions. Let's read what it says there in verse 44. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. There were two versions to Christ's body. The version that he had when he was crucified in humiliation, in dishonor and in shame. But there is the version of the new body that he has received from God in the transformed body that he received and that he experienced on this day that we remember as the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And Paul wants to tell this to, to, to these people at, at Corinth because they were quite keen to get rid of the body. They were Greek people and uh, the body was not that good so as soon as you can shed this old prison house, this mag bag of maggot flesh or whatever, you can discard the human body and then the, all the better for you. And Paul says no, the body is part of what God has given us and will be with us forever. But there are two bodies. There's two modes of existence as with the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a human, there's the body of humiliation, and then there's, a, the, there's the body of glory. And he wants the church to know that, and we need to know that today. There are two bodies. The same body that we have, but a radical transformation of that same body, Christians believe will be the body of their eternal state. Paul says in this chapter, it should not be a strange thing that there are different versions of bodies. Look around at creation. Look at all the different, uh, he says here in the earlier verses, the heavenly bodies in verse 40. They are heavenly bodies and they're earthly bodies. And their splendor is different. There's a whole host of variety within this creation. 
of different beings and different glory. Isn't the creation wonderful for the variety of God? And we see that out here. He just, he's always doing new things and never does everything exactly the same. There's a great variety in God. Paul said, well, isn't this so with, even with our bodies as Christians? There, there's the body of humiliation. And then there's the body of glory. God is a God of variety. And so it's not unusual as we look at creation. It's not implausible to believe in another body after we die. Look at creation. Of course, we could look at metamorphosis and caterpillars becoming butterflies, which is the great picture of the resurrection. Doesn't it tell us about this? So Paul says, look at creation. And particularly... In these verses, he draws our attention to look at the seeds. Look what happens to a seed when that is planted in the ground and then becomes and germinates and becomes a beautiful plant. Two versions of the same thing. One very uh, plain and unpromising. Doesn't look like much. It's like nothing's going on there. But you plant that seed in the ground and you just wait. For those of you who've been out to the Karoo after it's rained. It's a symbol of resurrection. It's total death. And you go there. And where did all this stuff come from? It's been there. It's been there. And this, this is what Paul is saying here. There's the current version of our bodies. But for those who trust Christ and look to Him... That's not the end. There is another version. There is a spiritual, heavenly, imperishable, immortal, splendid body. <coughs> but that's what he wants to remind this church and we remind ourselves today. There are two versions of the body in Jesus Christ. Seen and exemplified in Him who is our head. And Paul does this. By ultimately saying, this is because there are two human beings. Adam the first and Adam the second. Look what verse 22 says here in 1 Corinthians 15. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. And verse 45, Paul says, the first man Adam became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are earthly. And as is the heavenly man, so are those who are of heaven. Paul reminds us that there are really two humanities before God represented in their heads not heads here but in the leaders are the first man Adam and we are all sharing in the likeness here this morning in, in, our, in our ancestors I would love when I get to heaven to say Lord please play me the tape and we used to say that or please rewind that I can just go back of course, we'll be surprised who we related to on the journey back, I'm sure. <laughs> Especially for people in England and Scotland and Ireland. <laughs> but to, if we rewind, we've all come from ancestors, haven't we? And the Bible lifts the veil and said there is a primal pair, Adam and Eve, from which we all come. And we are... Adam the first, we are all sharing in his likeness and all in his image. We've all sinned like he sinned. We all died like he, he died. We share the type of body that he had, the body of dust and mortality that he had. <coughs> and we are all related to Adam the first. We are all members and generated from someone. It's humbling, isn't it? We individual, individualists and self-made people. No, you're not. You're generated from some ancestors. Totally dependent upon them for your being. And they, are, they likewise go back to somebody right in the beginning. 
And likewise with Christ. There is a new humanity Paul reveals here. On this day when Jesus rose from the dead, this new creation of his body, he is the head of a new race and of a new people. And for those who are in him and believe in him, they've got a new hereditary in their lives. A hereditary that doesn't go back to the first Adam. A hereditary that is rooted into the heavenly, raised, eternal, glorious, imperishable body of Jesus Christ. That's the hereditary of the Christian. <coughs> and of the new version of their body. It's always in the purpose of God. In these two Adams for the head first to be first. And all those who follow are part of and members of that one head. And Paul makes a lot here of the order. First, the first man, and then those who are in him. First Jesus on this day, the first fruits, and then those who are in him. This is the order in creation, isn't it? A good birth is head first. You come out head first, and then the rest of your body follows. And this is what Paul is saying. Jesus is our head. He's come out into the new world, the new birth, head first. The members will follow as they are in Christ. What a wonderful scripture, Paul says in, in, in Colossians chapter 1 verse 18. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And just the last fact that Paul then goes on to say here. In verse 50, he says, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Paul makes the point here that the current version of our body is not fit for the future, which can be great good news, more for some than for others. This is the fact that flesh and blood, the stuff that constitutes our, our current body, is not fit and is not able to inherit the future eternal glory that is there in Christ and in the Lord Jesus Christ. This body is a, is a, is a preliminary body. But it has to go if we want to have a body fit for the eternal state and a fit for life in the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> you cannot know the Lord in fullness unless you put off this version of the body. And no wonder the Apostle Paul said, to live is Christ and to die is gain. He felt that at the time of his dissolution of his life, he was actually going to be entering into fullness of exceeding joy that he felt it was a great gain for his life. This body that we have is incompatible for the future glory. It's quite a verse. Brothers and sisters, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. As I said, some of us don't have to be persuaded as, as this as much as others. But we know that the plug is pulled on this body already. It's going down. You can't stop the downward, the water going out of the bath. The plug is already pulled. And soon, sooner or later, it will empty. But God is saying in His Word here to the Corinthians, He's saying to them, but you can't enter the the fullness of glory in this present mode of existence. You can't receive the full weight of glory that's to come. Flesh and blood doesn't enter the kingdom of God. Well, those are some of the great facts. Facts exemplified in Jesus' death and resurrection from the dead about the human body and about His body. <coughs> I want you just to say amen before we go to some of these thoughts. You don't have to, but I think there are important thoughts. What are some great alterations in the mind from these great facts that I've mentioned to you?
Because faith applies the facts. And these, these alterations in our mind are very important. Because the scriptures reveal that the devil holds people in slavery over fear of death. In Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. Through, through certain mindsets, through certain thinking about life and about their bodies and about the future, people are held in slavery, even Christians who shouldn't be. And Jesus has come, and this day is a day of freeing us from the fear of death. And what I'm going to be just saying to you, which we can say amen to, we can say amen in Jesus. Amen. These are not just truths that, well, anybody is true for everybody, it's particularly and I trust this morning that most of us here have a personal relationship with Jesus as your Savior and as your Lord. That you've looked to Him and feel that now He's a part of your life and you love Him and trust Him absolutely for your life and salvation. And if that's so, then there are a few things we can just quickly look at that this day tells us. We can look at the fact that we are called, in the light of there's only one body that we have, we are called to honor the Creator's work in our current body. Amen. How many of us have not struggled with the self-acceptance of our bodies? Or even longed for something totally different because of hardships or incapacities that you have in your physical body? There are psychological and physical reasons why we could wish to have a different handout when we were born, or be like somebody else. I've said to you, and it is the truth, this body, Christ, I'll have the same body with me forever. It'll be different, but it's going to be the same body. In the miracle of the resurrection, this body will be raised. And so, I need to honor God in this current body that I have, with gratitude. And that means he, we, we glorify God in our bodies even when we don't like things in ourselves and in our body. We are acknowledging God is our creator. He hasn't made a mistake about me, how I look, or about uh, my physical frame. He, he is the gr great infinite variety cre uh, vari creator of variety. He's made us all different in His splendor. And I accept who I am, who He has made me in this frame, and I glorify Him for that. God is glorified when we can accept our human bodies that we are given. As thankfulness to Him, even when there's every reason that it looks like He's made a mistake, or He's allowed difficulty to mar something, we can thank God for how He has made us. We can also know that God reserves the best for the last in His process. This is how God works. First the old version, Paul says here, and then the better version. That's the order. He reserves the best for the last. And we need to wait in faith for the last to come and have a lasting lead. Amen. 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 <laughs> no, I don't have to be a cliche. <laughs> Another thing about the fact of these bodies is let's see the new version by faith. This is what Paul wants these Christians to know, and this is what this day is about. In Jesus, do you do you see in Jesus through his resurrection something bigger than your story than you thought? The story of your life is not just ending in the grave in Christ. Our stories never end. And they end in glory in Jesus. And we need to see the invisible by faith. That's what faith is. Seeing things which we cannot see. And for the Christian it means seeing marvelous, great and magnificent blessings that will come to us at the return and resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And we need to see that by faith. You're not going to see the future of that plant by looking at the seed. It looks like it's nothing, that seed. 
And only in faith can you look at the seed and see there's a whole new glory in that seed. Just give it time. And it will soon become a glorious plant or tree. Let's not also, in the light of these facts, be sentimental over this old version that we're wearing this morning. Oh, we can be so sentimental, can't we? Now, yesterday was a cold day and I took out my old corduroys. Oh, I love my old corduroys. <laughs> I showed my mother-in-law and I, oh, it's a great time. Winter is here and they're all warm. They're not taking those away from me. <laughs> but I'm, we can be, are men sentimental about clothes? <laughs> Often we're old clothes. But uh, it's very easy, isn't it, to be very attached to the current version that we've got and sentimentally uh, attached and, and our, it's natural and our emotions get attached to this current frame, our current mode of existence. But the resurrection detaches us from that sentiment. It wants to disenchant us about this human frame by looking at something far more glorious that will, that will come. And in the light of the newer version, this current version is, at times, maybe a little bit of a joke we might one day have about this body. You know when you go on YouTube or you listen to, or you see, remember the Nokia 90, in 1995 I got my first cell phone? You've seen that thing. I know some of you would want to go back there because it's like an only phone and SMS. But remember the Nokia with the big pads and the big aerial and just the blank, just the screen, nothing, just the basics. Now it's a little bit of a joke and it's a, we have a bit of a giggle of old things, don't we? When, when Christians receive their new version, there'll be a bit of a giggle about the things that, hey, you were hung up about that. It's embarrassing. There's something far bigger. We mustn't be too sentimental about this old version. We also, will you give me an amen to this, don't invest in this old version as if it is everything. Amen. The world tells you the exact opposite, isn't it? Pour your life and your money and everything just, to, just in your health and everything to try and stay alive because this is all you've got. In the light of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, we don't have to invest everything in this body as if it's all, because it is not all. Christians should be different to how they think about their longevity in this life. Our objective is not trying to live as long and have the best body as possible here. That's not the Christian objective. It's very easy to be persuaded that that should be. And to have our faith in God dependent upon our physical well-being or how long we live or how much we can be healed, etc. That's not ultimate. This is not all. Let's not be duped by the world. We have to really think as Christians seriously about this. In the light of, we've just been through this pandemic. And we were all told that, well, everybody's going to be dying. And we know now 0.5% or so of people were at risk. But it's very easy to, to hold on to this life as if it's everything. And invest everything in longevity here. Let's also know that healing of the old version is not a priority. You go to churches, that will be the you'll be healed. We come for your pray for your healing. Healing is the priority. This old version, it's on the way out. Praise God when they are, he stems that process. He does heal and intervene. But it's not a priority. If you are not healed, it's no sign that you have a lack of faith. It can be a, a sign that you are actually, the Lord is just wanting to remind you that you're going to put off this body soon. It's not a priority for us. Because of the new version, this flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And see death, the light of this day, see death as a sowing of the seed of your life. In hope 
of something great that is yet to come. It is not the end. It is a sowing in hope of something that will yet be more glorious and far better. So those are some alterations in our mind. But no, and I want to close off with this, the big question is, to be or not to be in Christ? That is the question. These things are in the new Adam. Are you in Him? Let's pray. Lord, help us to change our mindsets, the way we think now, in the light of what you have revealed in your glorious body. Thank you for your imperishable, durable, immortal, physical body that you are now in at the right hand of God the Father. And thank you that for those who believe in you, for those who are in you, thank you that that is our future glory and destiny. Thank you that your body is the warrant and ground for our new version and the eternal body. We thank you for that glorious day that will come and we pray that you would hasten that. The day when you return, that you raise the dead to life everlasting and in a glorious body. We thank you for the gospel of Jesus and the resurrection. Help us, Lord, how we think of our own bodies. <coughs> Sober us, that we would have a robust and a true faith. Keep us from investing an inordinate and unreasonable amount of time and attention and money on trying to prop up this first version that is perishable and that is going to see you. Keep us from that. Free us from the fear of death through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Free us, Lord, that we could live free because we know that the story doesn't end, that you have kept the best for last, and that through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we can be set at liberty. Thank you this morning for this day, and all that it symbolizes. Thank you for these truths. Be with us, and let the power of the resurrection remain and abide. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.